All right, so this uh, video lecture is more of a walk through it, um, follow along with me of how we might consider organizing, labeling, and categorizing and coloring in our periodic table in a way that would help you be able to understand all the various elements of this amazing model. I think actually the best model in all of the scientific community. It was this periodic table. Um, so quick note, you will most likely not be able to use this periodic table, this colored in version on any type of assessment um, as this is just simply a step to help you ingest all the information. Uh, if you are a little taken aback, specifically in honors chemistry, by terms that you're like, I don't know what this, what she's saying, why am I labeling this? Don't worry, we'll get to it later in future lessons. All right, let's begin. So I'm just gonna go by kind of categories of families, that is peer, uh, columns, right? Families or groups. So the first uh, group is alkali metal, alkali metals, and I'm just gonna color this in, okay? And maybe proceed with the same. This is alkali. And then I'm gonna color in my next metals, very similar, but slightly different shade. Oop, gee willikers. These are alkaline. Now, quickly, I actually made an initial mistake. I just got lazy. Hydrogen itself is actually not a metal. So I'm gonna be careful to not highlight hydrogen. I apologize for those of you that already went in with marker or highlighter that is unerasable, my bad. Um, and I'm actually gonna quickly make this yellow to represent <clears throat> its uniqueness. But anyway, alkaline, all right, let's go back to highlighting our alkaline category, another category of metals not as reactive, okay? They tend to take on a plus two charge when they form an ion, whereas alkali tends to take on a plus one charge when they form an ionic bond. Um, then we have our nonmetals over here. So I'm just gonna take my little highlighter and say that these are our non-metals, all right. I'm gonna leave that actually as a special category over here. Um, let me make sure I'm getting this right by double checking myself. Okay, oops, here we go. Non-metal, non-metal. Ooh, I think there's a better way to highlight this. So let's do, let's do our non-metals. Sorry, I'm double checking against my periodic table to make sure. Two, two, two. Let's see. Good. And okay. And okay. All right. Uh, so these are kind of our standard non metals. And I'm going to put a quick label. In fact, um, all of these are technically nonmetals, and you're going to see why in a second I kind of isolated some of them in the highlight. But let me just do it, move this up. Pew. Right, nonmetals. Okay. Um, then we introduced metalloids. So this is why I was careful to kind of backtrack and avoid highlighting. Um, certain compounds because here we have boron, silicon, all right, geranium, germanium, germanium, arsenic, antimony, tellurium, all right, and polonium. These are unique because these are what we call our metalloids. They behave or they have characteristics of that is similar to that of metal and nonmetal. So these are our metalloids and they create a staircase, all right? Um, let's quickly assign charges before I get too far. So non-metals tend to gain electrons whereas metals tend to lose electrons. So if you gain an electron, you're going to gain a negative overall charge. So we like to say that <clears throat> um, nitrogen likes to gain three electrons, therefore taking on a negative three charge. Oxygen, negative two, fluorine, negative one. And of course, then we have our noble gases, 
which everybody wants to be. And they're relatively unreactive, except for on specific circumstances where they can form an expanded octet in a Lewis structure. But overall, these are a special category of nonmetals that we say as noble gases, and they're relatively non-reactive. Now, um, what about boron and carbon? Why didn't I give them a charge? Well, boron and carbon actually, okay, take on, again, remember, boron is technically uh, is able to behave like a metal. So boron actually tends to take on, when in an ionic compound, a positive three charge. It actually favors to lose electrons, becoming more like the noble gas behind it, helium. Carbon's family, the carbon family all down that column is unique because it can actually behave as both a cation and a anion by taking on a positive plus or minus, okay, sorry, when I said positive, I meant plus or minus, positive or negative um, for charge in a compound, all right? Um, more on that to come. Don't let that get you too confused. Um, don't forget these charges apply to the elements below that column, all down that column, all right? Uh, hence why we love the periodic table. It organizes for us to be able to predict periodic Okay, predict patterns in elements. So um, let's continue filling on. Then we have, let me get a color that I like that's slightly different. Then we have these transition metals and I actually want them to stand out a little bit more. So we'll do an icky, ooh, an icky orange, okay? These transition metals, all right, here in the middle, and this is kind of an old periodic table, so we've definitely filled out a lot of this. Okay, these are our transition metals, and that was such a bad coloring. Let's go this way. All right. Oops, too far. Okay, and then the filled in ones over here. These are our transition metals, and we don't really talk about them too much, especially when we're talking in terms of the Bohr model. However, these are essential for ionic bonding. All right. And don't forget the charges in here tend to change. These tend to have multiple, oops, charges, right? We use Roman numerals to represent, right, um, their charge. So I'm just going to put that as a note temporarily, but I'm going to erase it now. Um, so transition metals are really only addressed in the quantum model. Now, next, we have our inner transition metals. These are even funkier. These inner transition metals, okay, we really don't work with. In fact, they're mainly where we get nuclear chemistry, the nuclear chemistry material. Um, these are called inner transition metals. And they actually come, if you were to draw, oops, if you were to draw where they fall in the order of the periodic table, uh, this is actually like an extension of this row, row number uh, six, and this down here is an extension of this row. So one thing you might want to add is your row n equals one, ooh, gee willikers, that's really small, n equals two, n equals three, n equals four, n equals five, our principal quantum number, if you're looking at the quantum mechanical model or our energy levels or periods, right? The, we can go under several names to categorize this and talk about the same thing just from a different context. n equals six and n equals seven, all right? So uh, let's continue filling on. Uh, these right here are some more metals. Aluminum G. Willikers. Let me go ahead and highlight this. So everything on the other side of those metalloids then are also categorized as metals. All right. So we get our generic metals, our overall metals. Let's do a quick labeling. All of this, including the alkali, are what we call our main group metals. And we here we ignore ignoring transition. So uh, let me make it more specific periods. 
period one, two, three, skip over. Ooh, you know what? Let's just leave it at that. We'll just leave it at that. So uh, main group metals, uh, the transition metals, if you could collapse the periodic table and like make the transition metals disappear, uh, those would be our main group metals. Uh, the lithium column, the beryllium column, the boron column, all right, are main group metals. And then you have your metalloids that are stair-stepping all the way through. And then you have our non-metals and noble gases, a specific section of non-metal. All right, so that's kind of like the main groups that we've talked about. Um, and as well as the charges that they tend to take on if they form an ionic compound. Remember, covalent molecular um, bonding does not form distinct charges because there's not full transfer of electrons. That being said, um, we may or may not, by the time you get to this video, have talking about the quantum mechanical model and the concept of orbitals, right? The orbitals. Um, let's go ahead and section off, label our sections of orbitals, and I'm going to choose a green. So these two first columns are called our S orbital. All right. Spherical. They hold a total of two electrons. They have like two seats for electrons. You can kind of think of this like a stadium, like multiple layers of leveling your seat. Uh, the next K okay, orbital is your P orbital. These six columns. The next orbital is your D orbitals. These 10 columns. And the final orbital is down here, your F orbital, these 14 short columns, all right? Um, this will become important for you as you navigate electron configuration and uh, APRs orbital diagramming. So uh, that's kind of like the big idea behind the periodic table. If you would like to add in electronegativity, atomic radius, ionization energy trends, you are welcome to. However, I do think it'll get quite cluttered so you can get creative with that. Um, but there you go. I hope you had fun coloring in. I also hope this is a really good visual for you guys. All right, have a great day, you guys, or evening if you're watching this late. Bye.